Good evening to everybody. How's everybody doing on this Wednesday evening? Hump day. How you doing? Welcome to another exciting time for Urban Birds and Bees. I'm your host and moderator, Kerry Neal. And we got quite the show for you. We got part two, part two of Black, Biracial, and Light Skin, What's Causing the Divide. Oh my God. We had an amazing time last week and we talked to our uh, light skin and biracial brothers and sisters of our community. And we had quite the interesting conversation. And so now this is part two, and we're talking to uh, the other members of the Black community who may be a little bit more darker in hue. So it should be an exciting time in terms of what the reactions may be and things like that and all the other dynamics um, that we may not be aware of. And we're going to get down to the bottom of some of these things. Again, my name is Kerry Neal. I am your host and moderator for Urban Birds and Bees. Um, really quick, we're going to uh, let you know exactly what is Urban Birds and Bees. Of course, we're a podcast, right? But we are a podcast that provides an emotionally safe space to have honest, healthy, and provocative discussions about dating, relationships, sex, love, self-worth, and personal growth to help you become the best partner in a committed relationship and identify who might be best for you help you be able to uh, make the right selection for a relationship. So that's what we do here. Um, now, we typically are always talking about marriage, talking about uh, dating, dating dynamics, and, you know, navigating things that may uh, preclude us from an amazing relationship. But right now, we're going to focus on the part that talks about self-worth and personal growth. And so now we're adventuring off into this particular area as we talk about Black biracial and light skin in the black community so so the goal of this particular podcast right okay is an exploration of the feelings and the sentiments towards light skin and biracial members of the black community hmm very interesting you know before we get started uh we have a correction to make so last week uh with the previous podcast in part one we talked about a lot of members uh who are sort of pillars in the black community over the past 50 years and you know in terms of how they sort of led the, the social justice mission of, of our community and we talked about how a lot of them were biracial or just light-skinned and we mentioned that Angela Davis was biracial meaning that her mom was white and her dad was black we have to stand corrected that's incorrect her mom is actually biracial and she was also a juggernaut in the social uh, uh media space as well social excuse me social justice space as well so that's a beautiful thing. And also, we have this amazing panel that's here, and we'd love to introduce our panel to you today. We have um, we have Lynn Beatty. Lynn, say what's up to the people. Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Yeah, awesome, awesome. And then we have another Lynn on here. We've got Lynn Silverberg. Lynn, say what's up to the people. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Okay, awesome. Uh, then we have, we got Cedric on the line as well. Cedric, bro, say what's up to the people. What's up, family? How y'all doing tonight? Yeah, that's what's up, what's up. And then we got Cuzzo on the line. We got Jackie. Jackie, say what's up to the people. She's got to like take herself off mute, kind of figure it out. And so far, she's not figuring it out. Okay, while she's figuring it out, we're going to go over here to Erica. Erica, say what's up to the people. Say what's up to the people. Uh, mute. How you guys doing? I'll tell you awesome stuff. Okay, so uh, Jackie, you got your uh, mute thing working okay? Can you take yourself off mute and say what's up to the people? Can you? No? Yes? No? Yes? You know, we'll work it out. We'll work it out. At any rate. And then we want to also welcome 
a very, very special guest that we have on our program. We have the one and only Dr. Chris Mars, who's just getting in from Howard University because she's been promoting her book called The Love Jones Courthood. Uh, and she's been like, wow, doing some amazing things, that book. And she'll talk a little bit about it. But let me just give you a little information on who uh, Dr. Chris Marsh is, right? And she's been able to grace our panel. Thank you for dropping in. Uh, she received her PhD in sociology from the University of Southern California, Fight On, back in 2005. And in 2017, she uh, was appointed as a Fulbright Scholar under President Barack Obama. Now, her research explores the general areas of the Black middle class and consequences of being Black in of being in the Black middle class, excuse me, including their dating practices and an emerging Black middle class that is single and living alone. And again, we just mentioned uh, she's the author of the book entitled The Love Jones Cohort, Exploring the Unmarried Black Middle Class. Now, she's been featured on CNN. She's a frequent contributor, I should say, on CNN, Associated Press, NBC, Washington, Washington Post, and BET News just recently. They did a big thing on you, right? So we want to welcome Dr. Chris Mart. Dr. Chris Mart, say what's up to the people. What's up, Chris Mart? What's going on with you? <laughs> Carrie, Neil, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Good people, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm just so excited for the conversation. Yeah, awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. So uh, now we're going to get ready to dive into our discussion. This is very, uh, you know, we got a lot of feedback from our first uh, episode on this uh, or first part of this three-part series on Black, biracial, and light skin in the Black community and what's causing the divide. We need to figure that out, right? Uh, so here are the, the, the categories that we're going to be dealing with this evening, right? The categories are history. So we're going to explore what has kind of gone on with us uh, as African-Americans, particularly with us of a darker hue. Um, and then we're going to talk about pain versus trauma. I was having a conversation with uh, Lynn Silverberg, and she kind of talked about that distinction. And she made some really good points. And uh, so it was only fitting that I felt like that would be a great category to uh, have for this particular podcast. And then we're going to talk about shrinking. So what is shrinking? Hmm. Have you had to try to be less than who you are for any situation? We're going to talk about shrinking, like is code switching shrinking? Very interesting, right? And we're going to talk about privilege. Ah, what are the privileges that we have in terms of being darker hue African-American, how do we perceive our brothers and sisters who are light-skinned and biracial and uh, what privileges that they may have, right? And last but not least, we're going to talk about, which is going to get a little bit hot up in here, beauty, dating, love. Ah, what's that all about? And how does, how we look factor into that? Uh, Jackie, look like you're, 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 um, you're, um, you've been on mute. You want to say what's up to the people? I think I finally figured it out. Okay, Hello, cool. everyone. Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, and, and and again, before we sort of dive here, I want to tell you what's what was the genesis to all of this. So, uh, I was talking to Lori Reed, who's a longtime uh, executive producer, uh, who's behind Doctor Phil and some other amazing shows, uh, and who happened to be a friend of the program. So, Lori, you out there? What's up with you? Thanks for tuning in. And so, you know, we're kind of exploring some of these interesting topics to talk about. And so, you know, we always talk about things, love, dating, some of those other controversial things that happen under the guise of trying to find the one that's for you. And we talked about how like, some people seem to be more preferred over the others. And so she, also being biracial, having a white mother, talked about how this has been a longstanding issue, obviously from the days of school days, you remember the wannabes and the jigaboos, but how it still is an issue today and some of the things that we need to be, need to be clear that they go through, they being uh, those are light-skinned and biracial uh, brothers and sisters, right? Uh, as a result of the treatment within the Black community, because perhaps one thing that drives it is the perceived advantages they may have that we don't have. And so we embarked upon this discussion, and it's been quite the journey, to say the least. So... Before we kind of dive in, so I want to go to Dr. Chris Mars. So now you've been a social scientist for some time now. All your students love your classes at yeah. the University of Maryland. Did I say that she, uh, she teaches at the University of Maryland College Park back in the DMV? Although she, that's Los Angeles is her home. But I want you to kind of talk about that for a second before we sort of dive in here. Talk about the, um, what are some of these dynamics as pertains to 
uh, this um, this hierarchy of who's more preferred. What does the research say? Talk about some of those things for us really quick. Again, Carrie Neal, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for giving a shout out to the book, Love Jones Cohort, Single and Living Alone in the Black Middle Class. Part of the reason why I'm here today is because Karen and I, all, I always talk to him and ask him for advice and we bounce ideas off of each other. And we were talking about colorism. And I mentioned that I talked about colorism a bit in my book. In fact, it's page 58 to 62, I believe. I talked about colorism. And so I think and being a colorist, and I think it's important to just kind of give a little bit of um, sociological context for the conversation that's going to be had. I, unfortunately, I missed the first conversation, and I don't know that I can stay for the whole conversation today. But I was actually, to Carrie's point, I was just at Howard today doing a talk about my book, and colorism actually came up. And what I think, but the part that I think is really interesting is that people have different perspectives, and people see things very differently. If we look at the social science literature, it is clear that there is an advantage for lighter skin folks versus darker skin folks. That advantage is cumulative. It starts at a very young age and it proceeds over for almost every life station on the life course. We're talking about education, we're talking about wages, we're talking about wealth, we're talking about health. There clearly is a, a privilege towards lighter skin or towards whiteness. The data is clear about that. If we even think about like there's my, my colleagues who have done some work who are economists have done some work looking at black women, darker black skinned women and mayor's proposals. And there's like a, there's a whole queue where you have lighter skinned women at the front of the queue and darker skinned women at the back of the queue. So the issue is that this kind of stuff is institutionalized. On a side note, it's so funny. I have a dear friend of mine. He's like, I just prefer light skinned women. And I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> no, seriously, you don't. You've been conditioned. You've been socialized and you've been brainwashed to think closer to whiteness is white. You privilege whiteness or close to whiteness. Someone told you that white is supposed lighter skin or closer to whiteness is supposed to be more attractive. You bought into that. So don't miss me on that entire conversation that you just like light skinned women. I'm like, no, you don't. You've been told that. So right. it is institutionalized. So here's where I think the conversation gets a little messy and a little slippery. So you have you have the data that's clear. The, the social science literature is clear. There is an institutional advantage in place for lighter skinned folks. And I'm using lighter skin, but I guess we can also put biracial in that category. But we got to be careful because not everybody that's biracial is also light skin. Right. Okay. But Very true. the other part, but the other part of that too is that you have some lighter skinned folks that are like, oh, you know what? I had to deal with racism. I mean, I I was discriminated against. I had to deal with a whole bunch of issues and concerns. That's an individual issue. I'm not taking anything away from it. I am not taking anything away from that. But I think it's really important to understand that's individual. One is institutionalized and one is individual. And if we try to superimpose the individual on the institutional, it's highly problematic. There is, an institu there is a structure in place mm. based on white supremacy that advantages whiteness and anything closer to whiteness is going to give you a positive outcomes, cumulative across your life course. If someone in, in Black America says to a lighter skin person, like, you've had it easier and you take offense to that, I appreciate you for the feelings that you have. But understand, that's not institutionalized. That's individualized. And we often kind of try to conflate the two, and the two are not related. That's so very we, interesting. We're okay. not the same magnitude. Sure, sure. Okay, that's very interesting. So let me ask you something. Okay, so you, you talked about this conditioning, and you talked about, obviously, we talked about the, the impact of white supremacy. Um, does the research show that uh, our darker hue uh, sisters, particularly in this, particularly as it pertains to beauty, because I want to talk a little bit about beauty for a second, because we're going to talk about this a little bit later on. But in terms of your research, um, you talked about, you kind of acclimated me to a couple of terms. It was the halo effect. And then was the beauty, what was it called? The beauty the something. Beauty the, the beauty cue. cue. Yeah. So talk about that for a second, please. Right. So again, I briefly touched, touched upon this in the book. It actually ends up in a footnote in the book. So I could talk about it tangentially. There's scholars that do more work on colorism than I do. In fact, someone sent me a proofs for a book that they wrote around colorism because it's still very present today. It is not an old topic. It is still a current topic. But so the right. beauty cue and the halo effect is kind of like to the point that I was making. You have people that are thought of as more attractive and you think of people that are as less attractive. The more attractive ones are on the front of the queue. They happen to be white, happen to be white closer to white, light skin, and maybe even possibly biracial. And the queue, as the way the queue works, the darker you are, the, the further you are in the queue. Mm. And the problem with that is that 
the ones that are in the front of the queue, besides like being more attractive in the dating market, they're also more attractive in the education market. They're thought of as being smarter, being more resourceful. They get all of the resources. And that's when that stuff starts like in elementary school, by the time you get to middle school, high school, college, it is a cumulative effect. So by the time you get to college, I'm like, you, of course, you're going to do better in college because everybody's told you that you're better than the darker skinned folks. Of course, people are conditioned to think that lighter skin or closer to whiteness is better. So you give the resources to the lighter skin person. So they're degree, they have higher uh, rates of degrees. They have higher incomes. They have higher wealth and they have higher marriage rates. And so all of that is pretty much consistent with this notion that we cater to, and we have a white, a privilege, we privilege whiteness or closer to whiteness structurally. It's mm. institutionalized in just about every single social institution. I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's wrong, but I think it's a little different conversation when a lighter skinned person, it takes offense to us or a darker skinned person saying, hey, you have privileges. That's a very different type of conversation. One is institutionalized and one is individualized. You know, that's, that's really deep because you're saying that this, this, um, oh. this curse, so to speak, <laughs> of like white supremacy that has infil infiltrated our community has been baked into society that is cooked into the very essence of our lip. So, and, and that's interesting because I'm thinking, oh God, this is interesting. I'm thinking- so, I mean, about, but you know, I don't even know that I would call it, I, I, don't, I don't know that I call it the curse, right? In some ways, and please understand what I mean when I say this, the well-oiled machine of white supremacy is still uh, very present today. I'm not saying it's right, but I am saying it's still very present today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, just call it, we just call it a different name, they're exotic. Yeah, the oh. yeah, curse is probably not a good term. I'm, I'm just, I'm yeah. kind of bumbling over here. I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah, it's no, no, like, I don't it's know interesting. I hope, but, I, but it's insidious. The yeah, insidious, insidious yeah. 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 Of yeah. white supremacy is still very present today. Yeah. It has yeah. real, yeah. real consequences. And that's also interesting. You talked about the proposal. I, I didn't even think about that. You was like saying that, li are you telling me that light skin biracial women tend to get proposed to far more than dark skin but and yeah, research so my, bears that out yeah so um my my dear colleague Derek Hamilton Sandy Darity and Art Goldstein I can't remember the last name they actually were trying to kind of tease out this kind of notion about colorism and they actually looked at national data and looked at marriage rates and looked at skin tone there's some data sets that actually collect skin tone of the respondents. And what they found is that like lighter skin women are more likely to be proposed to and or get, get proposals and convert that to marriage than our darker skin women. Yeah, that's and again, that's that halo. I didn't talk about the halo effect, but the halo effect is kind of the same thing. If you're lighter skin, you're all, you automatically get certain set of assumptions wrapped around you by school, by, by teachers. And so it makes you way more attractive. Since it makes you way more attractive, teachers are willing to add more resources, give more time, spend more effort with you. And that halo effect plays all the way out into the dating market as well. Oh, uh, golly. Wow. Now this is, this is, wow. I'm sure we got, I think I've seen smoke kind of coming from some of the sales here on the screen. Interesting. So, but really quick, um, cause I'm going to get to the panel, uh, but give us a, a, a quick synopsis of the love Jones cohort. What's up now? We all love the movie love Jones. So we know it's got something to do with love and relationships, but talk about what that book's all about and, what, and, and where people can go get it as well. If I could do my two minute elevator speech, the Love Jones cohort is really just trying to destigmatize singlehood. When we think of Love Jones, we think of, I want you to think of like the characters in the movie Love Jones, those that are young, professional, aren't married and don't have any children. I'm also a sociologist and demographer. So cohort is just a demographic trend. I mean, it's just a, a term for a group of a group or a band of people. So I'm trying to destigmatize singlehood in this book. And I'm trying to get people to think about being single and holding the title of single as a, and being very happy, healthy, and confident in that title, as opposed to accepting any kind of relationship that could be a toxic, could be oppressive, and could be unfulfilling, simply because they don't want to hold the title of single. Uh, and then I also have the, the lifestyle of those that are single. It's so, it's so, it's so um, unbecoming. We often talk about why aren't single people getting married? We don't ask married folks the same question. Why are you married? When we keep asking single folks, why aren't you married? It's a, it superimposes the deficit model on single folks. So I'm trying to get people to understand that singles are living very full lives. Although they may not be partnered, they may not be married. They are living very full lives. And that's what the book tries to do. Mm. 
Wow, very interesting. You can buy it on my website, uh, drchrismarsh.com. You can buy it on Amazon. It was bestseller in gender studies and some other economics. And you can buy it at Cambridge University Press. It's an academic book, but it's written more for a commercial audience. I think you might find some pleasure in it. Okay, awesome stuff. That's awesome stuff. Wow, well, thank you, Dr. Chris Marsh. So I'm going to go to our panel now. So I'm going to go to Cedric. You're the lone guy on here for right now. we got uh, two of our panelists apparently running a little bit late. Cedric. You heard what, she, uh, what Dr. Mars just talked about. What's your reaction to that? Oh, man, I just had a lot of questions pop up in my head. I just think, I just, uh, I guess from an academic question I do have is like in this study or does the research bear out like the discrepancy between pay scales as far as darker skinned women versus lighter skinned women? And I also wanted to know, is this more gender based or is this both sexes across the board? Yeah, that's a good question. Good care? question. Yeah, so the halo effect in the in the in the uh, beauty cue that ne isn't necessarily just towards women. The per the art the articles I was talking about about wages um, that that Derek Hamilton and Sandy Darity wrote that one does just focus on women. But there's also data that looks at wages for lighter skinned men versus darker skinned men, and the data seems to hold the same kind of trend. Okay, got you. But yeah, I just think as far as the reaction, I mean. I'm just going to say it real quick, and I'm pulling this quote from uh, James Baldwin. To be African, American is to be African without any memory, American without any privilege. And I mean, that's just basically what it is. And I mean, if you look at from a historical perspective in terms of slavery, just as far as the separation, I mean, the fact that we're still having this conversation in 2023 is mind-blowing to me. Yeah. You know, in terms of colorism and things of that nature. And I mean, it just goes to show how sick we are in this matrix in a sense yeah. and it's like we have all this wealth of information at our disposal that speaks to how this has been systematic institutionalized perpetuated throughout you know yeah just throughout our history but yet here we are still having these same conversations and honestly it's kind of sad to me to be honest yeah 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 for real for real erica I want to get your reaction to, and could you move a little bit just to your, I guess it would be your left and to our right. So, there you go. Go and get your center. There you go. What's up with your beautiful lady? What's up with you, Erica? Talk to us. And give us a reaction to uh, uh, some of these, um, this interesting uh, information that Dr. Chris Marsh just shared with us. Talk to us. Um, first, I'd like to say with the data, she used the word machine. I use that a lot currently in my, my where I work. The I call it the machine. It's, just, it's a metaphor that I use a lot because um, I, I currently reside in Arizona, but I'm originally from Brooklyn. And so living in Brooklyn, um, particularly in New York as a whole, you know, it's a melting pot of culture, right? You see a lot of people that look like you. So when I moved to Arizona, it was a culture shock. Um, it still is a culture shock. And I now... I can say now to this day, I'm starting to see the machine. I'm starting to see a lot of that mm. in the workplace, how it's like, um, just like Cedric, is a Cedric, right? Like he said about the, how it's sad that we're still living in that today, um, particularly like I'm, I'm the voice and I'm kind of rattling the cage a little bit, I guess, because I'm from Brooklyn and you see a lot of this conformity here where I am in Arizona, because you don't see a lot of people that look like me that's here. Mm -hmm. um, Arizona's maybe about 112 years old, very, very young state, um, and it's very different. Um, and I've had to deal with a lot of like control and, you know, right, control, right to work. Con control in what control, sense? Control in the sense of like, it's a right to work state. It's a, it's a blue state, you know, now starting to become a little bit of a purple state. Things are just vastly different. And you do see a lot of um, division amongst a lot of people you know people work and they go to school and things like that but you do see the divide you don't see a lot of community it's just very different things that i didn't see a lot when i was living where i was living before and not to say that it doesn't exist but in certain states it's more prevalent right uh, it's more in your more in your face and so i i'm dealing with like the culture shock of that which is a good eye opener for me because you know i have children and my children we have i have black boys you know african-american boys Two are older, one is younger, and they, we've had those conversations for them to be young black African American males. They've had to been faced with it more so than I have. I've dealt with it in the corporate sector, you know, um, but they've dealt with it 
in their age group when having to deal with those divisions. And so it is true, it's very sad to see those things go on now, but I think where you live and where you come from is more prevalent than in, in other areas. That's so. awesome, interesting, interesting, mm-hmm. interesting information. What we're going to do is because, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff that has happened to us over the history of our history in this country. But we're going to talk about some slightly positive and get into the, the nuts and bolts of some of these other things that we're, we need to get into the bottom line on. So, um, Lynn Silverberg, I'm going to go to you. So let me ask you a question. What's up with you, Lynn Silverberg? How you doing? You're doing rocking that dope hairstyle. What's up with you, girl? How you doing? Hey. hey. Yeah, what's up? What's up with you? So the question is, uh, what makes you most proud about being black? Talk about that. Oh, wow. Um, That is such a loaded question. But um, I love us. I love Black people. We have our own lexicon. It's so so nonverbal. We can have a conversation with each other and it can be completely nonverbal. And I love that about us. I love the fact that, you know, we kind of see each other as family. Look how we address each other, brother, sister. I think of... um, the movie Poetic Justice, you know, when they, they kind of roll up on the, the barbecue and they're like, hey, we all family. We may not know them for real, but we are all family. I feel that. But on, on a more serious note, um, achievement. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I say this um, biasly, but I think we are the most resilient people in this country. Yes. Um, considering where we started and to where we are now and all that we have achieved with the odds totally against us. So I think for me, that is what I am most proud of um, being a Black person. Nice, nice, nice. Let's go to the other Lynn. Lynn Beatty, what's up with you? What's up with you, Lynn Beatty? Now, you're a very successful, incredible, well accomplished Black woman. What, why, what, what makes you feel proud of being Black? Talk to us. Oh, uh, well, my fellow Lynn touched on some of it, just how resilient we are, our creativity. I think when I think of, of Black people and being Black, that, that part of what I love so much, I always refer to us as having more texture, more flavor. We're just so diverse, even within. Our, our own culture, um, that it, it just makes being an African-American. So I'm very proud to be an African-American. It's not that I haven't uh, endured uh, racism or other negative components of, of being Black in this country, but I wouldn't have it any other way. It, it's just, you know, we're, we're just so um, talented and creative. And because they made us do all the work, we became so much more, we became inventors and we learned how to overcome and get stronger up against, you know, any sort of barrier or adversity. And so I'm just terribly proud of that and proud of my ancestors who survived even worse than what we're experiencing today. So that's what I love about being Black. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go to my cousin, Jackie. Jackie, I'm going to give you the same question, but I'm going to modify it a bit, right? Okay. So, uh, um, I want you to talk about what's it like being a black woman. Pros and cons. Pros and cons. Well, there are no cons. Um, okay. Pros is that again. I'm speaking to a, a couple of things that both both Lynn stated about being prideful, uh, about being resilient, about being um, just knowing that no matter what struggles we've gone through. Uh, we're going to we're going to continue to be just an amazing. I have you know I have been in environments from school um, and work and work environments where I am the I am one I'm the only. Okay, it's so particularly growing up in school, um, elementary and high school, um, and it's just that the pride, the foundation that my mother gave me about just you can do this if you know if it is to be it is up to me so i have never allowed any uh, any kind of microaggression or just overt um challenge uh halt me from being you know my best person and the i i look at so i i would when i when i engage i'm thinking i'm i am responsible to be um uh, this the best i can be not just for me but my people you know yeah. i always think hey I, you know i can't I can't do that. That's not what, that's not, that's not representing my people. And the con is that, you know, I think sometimes, you know, there's just a, just a pre, you know, preconceived uh, assumption about when I walk in a room, oh, here we go. Is she going to be the angry black woman? Um, is she going to be the docile black woman? 
uh, you know, or or it tends to be more the angry black woman, you know, or is she competent? You know, did she get here on some kind of um, scholarship or did she get here through some type of affirmative action program? Right. So I've always feel that I got to say two steps ahead. So, I mean, I'm always just in that. So I guess if that's a con, I mean, I kind of see it as a strength that I just I, I, I walk in to be confident and just know that. I know people are looking at me. I know that there are unfortunately those who might be looking going, well, you know, we hope she falls, but not on my watch. Yeah, I, lo- I, I love that. But let's go with that for a second. We'll go back to you, uh, Dr. Chris Mars. Is there any research that suggests that, uh, that the self-esteem of Black people, particularly dark-skinned Black people, because, you know, you talked a lot about and very clearly about the halo effect and the beauty cue and the sort of this uh, institutionalized preferential treatment um, and optimism regarding our lighter skinned bro- brothers and sisters, right? So is there any research that suggests that, um, you know, how um, we as darker skinned black people, men and women sort of counteract that? What does, what does your research say? Or what, what are some things you've seen over your times of practice? You know how sometimes, like you know, pastors and black pastors just pull out scriptures from somewhere back way back there. I don't know how to pull out <laughs> academic articles just from way back there, so I can't say that I know of something I can just drop and be like, "Oh yeah, so John Doe did this in 1980." No, I don't know that. But what I do think is quite interesting around your question that you're asking. I read an article, I think it was either yesterday or the day before yesterday, and trigger warning, content warning. I'm going to talk about suicide. Um, it talked about the rise and suicide rates among Black adolescents, in particular, young Black women. And one of the things they found is that young Black women felt that they did not, the researcher, I can't remember the person's name, I can send, I'll try to find a citation. The, they were talking about how <clears throat> they analyzed uh, quali- uh, data, uh, national data for young Black adolescents. And I say adolescents, I think the age was up until 12, I don't remember the age. But they found that young black girls in particular said they didn't quite fit in. They felt like they didn't fit in. Now, I don't know what that fitting in is because I didn't read the whole article. It could be their hair. It could be the way they talk. It could be their skin tone. It could be a whole bunch of this. But what we have to understand is that some of this stuff that we're talking about now are the younger people are picking up on that. And we really want to make sure that we take care and protect our physical and mental health, but also take care of the ones that are coming before us because we say the slightest things, but they can be so incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. So my, like, for example, it's like my, my, one of my girlfriends calls her, calls her daughter yellow, my little yellow, my little yellow daughter, my yellow girl. And I'm like, how about your smart girl? How about your princess? How about your future doctor girl? Why she got to be the yellow girl? And they have a dark skin sibling and they don't say anything about the skin tone. So to not say anything can be just as dangerous as to say something at all. So I do think it's really important for us to think about like the conversations we're having. Young, the young folks are picking up these conversations that we're having mm-hmm. and the things that we say. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, wow. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, so we're going to ask our panel. We're going to we're going to go a little bit deeper now, right? We're going to actually be a little bit uh, more, tra- not that you haven't been transparent, but we're going a little bit deeper. And some of the stuff may be a little painful, but I think uh, as much as you can, we'd like you to share and, and answer the following questions um, as honestly as you possibly can. You know, a lot of people need to hear that. We're, make, we're making a difference here. So don't think that your efforts here is, is in vain. We're going to talk about pain versus trauma, okay? Uh, it's interesting. I want to define the word pain and then trauma. They're kind of linked, but they're slightly different. Pain is discomfort or kind of annoying, okay? Past pain, okay? But trauma is a deeply distressing or disturbing experience, okay? So I want to go to you, Erica. So the question is, are there any unspoken things that you have gone through as a black woman that you feel is a byproduct of being a dark-skinned black woman? Um, I would say yes, but I would, um, I think we piggyback on this yesterday. I think it stems from my childhood. I think okay. what I was exposed to in like my own family um, <clears throat> and then interweaving into me becoming a young adolescent and going into young adulthood and now me as an adult adult um I used to hear things like as a child like um you know 
uh, black or skinny or dark skin or ugly or comparisons to other things. I didn't know how to respond to that. Most of the time I would just probably shut down. Um, I was, I was mostly, mostly of an observant child. So I didn't really talk as much, but you start to internalize that, but you don't know what to do. You know, you're a child. You don't really know how to connect the dots to that. When it came to my family, I was the youngest of nine. So um, I had aunts of different complexions. I had an aunt that was fair skin. My mom, me and my mom have the same face, <laughs> look just alike. I was the baby. Then I had an aunt that was really dark. She married a, um, a, a white man. She had children that were biracial and you could never tell that this child was biracial. You thought her children were literally European looking. Um, she wasn't very close to the family. She segregated herself from the family. She did act different away from the family. Again, I was a very observant child. So I witnessed a lot of this. And when you know, when you're the youngest child, you see a lot, you see a lot more than the older children see from, from my perspective. So I was exposed to a lot of those things. And I was kind of, I felt ostracized or segregated in that sense, because I wasn't really paid attention to, or, and I, I kind of equated that with the, maybe my assumption of the, my complexion, because I was darker than a lot of my siblings. So I didn't get paid attention to a lot. So when I became mm. a younger adolescence and I grew up, I grew up primarily in the Bronx, but then I migrated to Brooklyn. I grew up around predominantly um, Dominican. So everybody was like culture, the music, the food, um, the atmosphere. Most of the people in Dominican, the area where I grew up were light skin, were fair skin, you know, light brown skin. They were different tones. And so that was another part that I couldn't I really identify with other than in my home, right? And so I had all these barriers. So me being the youngest, I kept to myself a lot. So there was a lot of identity things there that affected me. And then as I got older, I got into other things. And then I would hear things like, oh, you're pretty for a dark skin girl. And I used to question that. I was just like, I, yet again, I couldn't- I'm like, what connection. does that mean? You're pretty for a yeah, dark skin I, girl, wow. I never, I never Ooh. made the connection and I would always yeah. get offended. And when I started to- started to get older and things started to make sense. And I became more um, aware of my self-identity and started to become more assertive and speak up, you know, 16, 17, um, because I was heavily into the music industry and things like that. And I was exposed to a lot of things. Um, I noticed like in music videos, you never see dark skin girls. I don't know if you guys noticed that. It was like never any dark skin girls. It was always fair skin girls. When I went to high school, it was fair skin girls. Never had an issue with lighter girls, but this is what I was exposed to and what I saw. It was this unspoken language, right? Um, and then I would hear things like, oh, wow, I remember I went to high school with you. You're, you're so pretty for a dark-skinned girl. You, 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 you grew into yourself. You're so pretty just, for a dark-skinned girl. And I never, and I would always be like, what does that mean? And I would get so offended. Why you just can't say you, you're pretty, right? Um, and so those were my experiences, which caused trauma, but there was this internal trauma for me. Um, I don't feel like that today. There's probably bits and pieces of it, but it doesn't impact me as much. I'm more educated about it, but that was my own personal experiences growing up. Yeah. Uh, Cedric, okay, as a Black man, bro, talk to us. Um, what have you gone through? Just give us a, a short list uh, of what that might look like. Um, I know Ooh, we could probably talk man. for a while, but go ahead. Talk to us. Uh, I mean, I can identify what the sister just spoke about in terms of siblings. I just have a younger sister, but she's like very light skinned. So uh, it's like I can tell differences in terms of how family members and family friends uh, treated us differently in a sense to where they were more partial. Some were more partial to my sister and some were more partial to me. And so much so to where like my mom, yeah, kind of like distance herself from those individuals or what have you, you know, friends and family and stuff. So I've seen it from that perspective. Uh, I would say now, you know, just as an adult, like I'm a girl dad. It's like I have three beautiful girls, you know, and it's just like for me, it's just one of those things. It's like I want them to know that you're beautiful. Your hair is beautiful. They want to be like you. They want to look like you. They want to walk like you. All of that, right? Right. You know, so it's like, yeah, don't be afraid to wear your hair natural or what have you. Like, yeah, like be proud of your nose. Be proud of your lips. You have women spending thousands of dollars just to look like you or what have you. But what we see on television, the imaging, and I feel like that is my biggest fear. It's like I have to fight against all the imaging that's on social media, that's on television, 
on YouTube, all of that stuff. And it's just like pouring into them to where they feel like they're beautiful. I would even say the same thing, you know, as far as my wife and all the women in my life, as far as family and friends and stuff like that, like, yo, do you, be you. You know, you know, you, you know Sergio, I, I, I want to interrupt yeah. you for a second. And that's beautiful. I love how you stand in the gap for your daughters, for your wife and celebrate them. I want to talk about you. What do you go through as a black man, as a dark skinned black man? What is your experience? Give us a, a quick snapshot of that. I want to know about you as a black man. Uh, it's challenging. Yeah, it's challenging on several fronts. I mean, it's challenging on the home front. It's challenging on the professional front. You know, it's like having to move and put on different masks to to fit into particular situations or what have you. And like the sister spoke to earlier, you know, in terms of like when you're in the workplace, you know, are you the angry black man or what have you? No, I'm just a man. You know, it's like just because I'm not walking around and saying Jolly G Willikers and how are you, Bob, and all that kind of stuff doesn't mean that I'm angry. I'm quiet. Let's start with that part. I'm quiet. But you wouldn't know that if you just make these natural assumptions. So I would say, yeah, that's a little irritating. I would say like just being in the neighborhood, walking around or what have you, it's like, I have to be mindful. Like I'm a tall, I'm a big tall black man walking in a predominantly white neighborhood or what have you. I want to walk just like everybody else. I don't want what it is that you have. I probably have more than you anyway, but that aside, like, why are you bothering me? I'm not bothering you. Right. So, yeah, I would say that's what my experience is like, you know, for the most part. But, you know, like I said, it's not all bad. Like I said, I'm proud of who I am. I stand tall in terms of who I am and I'm not going to shrink myself for anybody because yeah. you want to be like me. You're mad because you're not me. So, yeah, yeah. Say that. Say that. What we're going to do is. um, Well, OK, so. OK. All right. Dr. Chris Mars, thank you so much for coming on, man, and, and hanging out with us. So it was a beautiful thing. And I know she just got in from Holland. So she was uh, she decided to bless us uh, with, with her presence. What I'm going to do is um, we're going to play a video clip. And this is from the Tammy Mac show. Um, they were having a conversation about race, kind of what we're doing right now. So what we're going to do, we're going to uh, peep at what they're going to talk about. So let's do this. So so let's roll that video clip. And we're going to talk about it on the other side. A lot said here about you uh, being able to identify yourself as biracial. What is your preference? Would you prefer to be identified as black, white, or biracial? You know, I had to take some deep breaths during that break. I'm literally sweating over here from everything that was said. I was doing my best to remain professional and not just interject myself. Um, it's me personally, I feel forced to say biracial a lot of the times, you know, I personally like to identify as black and I have an amazing reason. Like, I feel like, you know, Cynthia from her personal experiences might be on base, but from, you know, I feel like it is a huge generalization for a lot of biracial people. You know, me personally, my father's Nigerian. Like I said, he is not mixed with white in any way, shape or form. I grew up celebrating Kwanzaa. He has African names for all of me and my siblings, you know, so I grew up celebrating those types of, you know, cultural differences. My mother, she may be biracial and seen as white in society, but she herself was raised by my grandfather. That's a Black Panther. So to say that, you know, white people or white women are, you know, subjecting the Black children to white ideals is not always true. My mother was very much raised as a black woman herself. Like people hear my mom talk and they're like, where are you from? What do you mix with? Because there's nothing white about her except for the tone of her skin, barely, you know? So to say that, you know, we, me being biracial, having a white mom means that I have these white ideals and that my father wasn't present or didn't raise us with any other, you know, ideas as far as our black history is very upsetting, you know, and it's like, I have full blood siblings that are much darker than me. We were raised exactly the same. Why do they get to identify as black and I don't? What do you identify as? I identify as black. Mona Lisa, <laughs> Mona Lisa uh, how, how do you feel? Jump in here. 
Well, you know, I'm, I'm feeling the same way I'm sweating over here. I don't even know why Every time I start talking about this whole subject. It makes me really ang filled with anxiety because, you know, ever since I was younger, I've always, I've never been black enough. I've never been white enough. And as I grew older and I started working in um, uh, the television field and in the field of social justice, I, I just, I've never been anything other than they don't know what I am. They're always questioning, is she black, is she white? What difference does it make? What difference does it make? That's number one. Number two, when I was younger, when I was younger, um, I was raised in a predominantly black neighborhood. My dad uh, and mother stayed together until I was about eight years old. And then my dad, married a black woman and so therefore my she pretty much raised us and kind of put all the stuff in us and i really didn't get to know any part of my white family they deal they disowned disowned us because they said and i will quote this i will have nothing to do with raising nigger children that's what my grandmother and my grandfather told my mother who's no longer here on the earth that they would have nothing to do with us. And so we knew nothing about our white side of our family. But does that mean that I didn't experience it growing up? No, it doesn't mean that because I've always been around all types of people all of my life. But my true experience and the way I grew up was 100% black. And how do I identify is I am a black woman just because my skin does not denote that. Girl, you better look at my hair, okay? <laughs> my hair. My hair is better now these days that we have all these great products, you know, that are designed for multicultural women and for mixed women. But when I was younger, I looked like a nappy headed big fro chick. I mean, I just looked like nobody could do anything with my hair. My mom didn't know what to do. My dad didn't know what to do. It wasn't until my dad married a black woman that she started being able to do something with my hair. And I started feeling like a human again and like I was beautiful and like I had reason and purpose to live. Wow. Okay. Interesting, right? Yeah. And you know, what's interesting, what they talked about on there was almost in using different words, but almost identical to some of the things we heard last week on the previous podcast on, on part one of this series on black, biracial, and light skin. And what I thought was even further interesting was this, just to have a conversation about it. I mean, at least three or four people in terms of preparing for the podcast, they all, and it kind of blew me away. They all said the same thing. Why do I feel I'm getting all worked up? Why is this anxiety all of a sudden coming over me? Just to reflect on what their experience has been. Now, this is from our lighter skin brothers and sisters in the community, in, our, in the Black community. Wow. So I want to get your, your reactions to this. This was very interesting in terms of what their responses were. So, Can I chime in? No, oh, sure. Absolutely. Please uh, jump right in. I don't know if anybody else like got chills from the last comment when she said nappy headed something. I don't, I don't, I don't know that comment. I don't know. That just kind of did something to me. Okay. And I, yeah. So that's my only reaction to that, how she was identifying or relating that to. I don't know what that comment was for, but I just thought that that was interesting that she said that. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Gary. Can yes. you, um, because I, I didn't see that entire broadcast, what was it that the person just before them said that really bothered the two of them? Uh, something about being, you know, identifying more with their white heritage or something. Right, right. And, and the video was sort of taken out. Obviously, we don't, can't show the whole uh, video clip. Sure. But, but, the, um, but the previous person was uh, making the case that, people who are biracial or have at least one black parent or one white parent in this sense, uh, that they should identify as biracial. And I probably should provide that context. That's my apologies. So let me provide that context now. So the previous person that was talking that you didn't have a chance to see on this video clip talked about that she felt as though that uh, biracial people, those having a white parent, uh, should identify as biracial and not black. Because one reason what she said was, is that they take away opportunities that darker skinned women don't get, say, for instance, they fill out a job application and that they identify as black, although they're biracial, that that leaves a deficit and puts uh, darker skinned black women behind the curve, behind the eight ball, so to speak, and just using that analogy. 
And then she talked about that, um, why can't you just identify as just being biracial? Because if you identify as black, you're essentially rejecting the white parent. So that's what's her response. So she gave a very thoughtful explanation of why she identifies as black. And then she, you heard what her response was. So Lynn, B, let's stay with you on that question. What, what, now that you have a little more context on that, what are your thoughts about that? What do you think about what she just said? Well, for one, to some extent, many of us are multiracial, you know, because, you know, just the history of our country, there's been a lot of what the old folks mm -hmm. used to say, uh, fence jumping. <laughs> I'm going way back. <laughs> but but uh, <laughs> um, so I don't I don't necessarily need someone who's biracial to claim that so that I have more opportunities. I'm not buying that part of it. I, I I'm just not. I mean, I, I don't I think you know, if, you're not buying you're not buying what part would be clear. You're not buying I'm not part. buying the part that this particular individual wants to claim being biracial versus black because she wants to give dark skinned black women more opportunities. I, okay. I'm call, I'm calling BS on that. Okay, I, gotcha. I, 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 you know, I'm just calling BS. Now, if she wants to say um, that she's doing it because she does have a, a white parent as well, and she doesn't want to kind of identify with just one parent or the other, I, I totally respect that, though. But I, 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 I don't think that um, the, the part about her concern about darker skinned black women sounds legit. So, so Lynn Silverberg, okay, let me ask you something. So do light skinned people uh, or biracial people have to, to write to say that they, they have it hard? What are your thoughts about that? I, I mean, because they kind of talked about that pretty intently, where it's like, well, here's what we go through. And uh, particularly the second person, Mona Lisa, I think, or then Mona Lisa Johnson, she talked about that. What, what, what's your reaction to that? I thought that clip was very interesting to me. Um, putting colorism aside, okay. it's about a respect issue. If this is what a person wants to be, how they want to be addressed or how they want, you know, you to, you know, how they want to be viewed or how they show up in society, I think you should respect that. Now, if this is blonde, blonde hair, blue eye, then we got to have a conversation. I'm like, are you, are you sure you're black? You know, <laughs> but um, just... Uh, did the sound go out? Yeah, I, I we can't hear you, Lynn. Lynn, we can't hear you. Lynn, your, your sound, sound went out. Okay, she may have some Wi-Fi issues. Okay, all right. So, um, okay, so, um, so Jackie, same question. What, what what was your reaction to that that video? You know, the question it reminds me of um, my mom. Um, my late mom um, was have a question because my mom, um, born and raised in the South, um, was, she, was she dark skin? Um, no, she's actually a bit more fair than I am, Got it. but we were, you know, I say a lot on black and I'm proud. We grew up in that element. And, um, I remember when, um, well, let me stick to one story, but anyway, so when my mom, after, um, having her relationships and her ch children, um, you know, my sister and I had left and, you know, gone to college and whatnot. And my mom was like, okay, wow, I, I'm, you know, I want relationship. I want love. I want, you know, I want to have some apartment in my life. Well, my mom actually married a white man and it was so amazing to me because that was just not something that she would ever have done. Okay. Because, you know, growing up in the South in a one room, one room a school and just the you know Jim Crow and all everything about uh, you know just just racism and discriminatory practices. So, but the family eventually accepted this. My my uncles and whatnot because they just could not believe the strong African American woman was going to do this. Um, but you know, and my and my stepfather is a, is a saint. I love this man. Um, um, he's actually the only father figure I've actually had in my life. I don't I don't have a relationship with my father. But I bring all this up to say is that we talk about um, growing up. Um, and so I remember once, you know, my, my dad had made a statement saying something about, yeah, it was hard. And my mom said, yes, it might've been hard for you, but your heart is not like my heart. 
mm. you know, so. So we're comparing pains now. Right, right. So I, I say all that to say is that I, I, I heard their story and I understand that that might've been some struggle, some, some just issues with people um, trying to define them and not knowing what they are. But again, that pain is not like some of the pain that as darker hued people go through. So I say it's, it's relative. So I hear you, but not quite sure I feel you. Okay, so, so you're saying that while uh, <laughs> light skin and biracial people may experience some pain and trauma, it, 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 it pales in comparison to what uh, we as darker skin black people go to. Interesting. Raz Williams. Uh, so we want to welcome our, our, one of our panelists who, who joined in. To, now, Raz is a good longtime friend of mine, and he has an uh, interesting background as well. Uh, Raz, I want you to talk a little bit about that, but I also want you to talk about this whole notion in terms of uh, this comparing pain and trauma, so to speak. So let's talk about this whole thing of, you know, what Jackie just said that, oh, I do believe that you got a pain. You know, you go to the doctor and says, so what's your pain level? It's on a scale of one to 10. We'll say, oh, seven. And we'll say, essentially say ours is like a 20, right? So talk about that in terms of some of your experiences, but react to what the previous panel just said on the video clip. Okay. Um... So when you say my personal experiences as far as far as what like being dark skin, you mean like can you be more specific? I want to talk about being dark skin, but I also want you to put that in the context of what they're saying in terms of what they went through. So we're kind of talking about this comparing pain, so to speak. Uh, okay. There's there seem to be panelists here that may, may believe that uh, darker, I mean the lighter skin, uh, black people and biracial people who identify as black in the black community or just biracial, um, they don't go through what we go through. What's your reaction to that? Uh, I don't think that's true. I think it, I think pain is pain. I think um, uh, we get discrimination within our own race, I, I would say, and from different sides, uh, whether you're light skin and, you, and you're not black enough and all that kind of nonsense, you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, me personally, I mean, uh, I, I was born in the UK in, in London, England, and uh, you know, my background is West African, which is uh, Guyanese and Cape Verde. If you know about the Cape Verde Islands, it's very mixed. It's actually 90% mulatto, which is like, uh, if you let, like go to Brazil, it's very similar to that uh, kind of makeup. Now, um, because of colonization, um, the dark you are, you know, <laughs> you, you get more of a hard time. So, um, you know, grew up in the UK, where we had, I, I experienced a lot of racism as well. Um, and then, you know, as you grow up, you know, you try to fit in and, you know, um, you're too dark, you know, you look African, but, you know, back then when I was growing up in, in school, it was not cool to be African, you know what I'm saying? Because the, the only images they would see, would show us was with kids with snotty noses, you know, you know, malnutrition and everything and flies buzzing around their head. So nobody wanted to be African because the images we saw was not cool. But as mm. we got older and we kind of, you know, experience life and we know wait a minute this is not this is not real this is not true and then you kind of grow up to realize that you know um you know i love my black skin i love my melanated skin it's beautiful you know what i mean and so um but i i experienced racism from from uh from you know from all, all sides within within the black community within you know from outside so i mean it is what it is okay okay interesting stuff uh lynn you had your hand raised lynn silverberg you had your hand raised as soon as you have a a, a comment talk to us What's yeah up? i actually love what i hope i'm not saying your name wrong raz i like what you just said i do think that um there's pain on both sides but i will agree with um the sister earlier i do believe that we do experience i think our pain is a little deeper mm -hmm. because and and i think it's why it's deeper is because of the privilege we don't have that privilege that, you know, that, that light skin privilege. And I think that's what separates us or that's what deepens the pain because we don't have that experience. We don't have that to leverage. Um, and therefore we are more likely to experience discrimination and, you know, um, more racism, you know, generally. So I do think there is a, a, a difference, but okay. I do recognize their pain and I do recognize that their struggles as well. They just, they just, their, their pain don't pales in comparison to our pain is what you're saying. Yes. And, and okay. And you okay. Cedric, what are your thoughts on that, bro? 
Yeah, I mean, just for the sake of conversation, I'm going to have to push back a little bit because I think, again, it's like, are we doing the pain or trauma Olympics when it comes to pain? <laughs> you know what I mean? To be honest with you, as black people, we all catching hell in some shape, form, or fashion, some more than others in different aspects and different situations and stuff like that. And again, not to, you know, minimize, you know, anyone's, you know, experiences, but I just think, again, this is the systematic problem that we have just within the black diaspora in terms of just comparing and contrast and all that kind of stuff again we're all going through hell yeah here 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 on this planet you know hell like i said it's just like i said it's just mind-boggling to me again that we're still having this level of conversation in 2023 with everything else that we have going on that we got to take time to discuss this just because we just have this continental divide when it comes to colorism yeah. Eric, I'm curious. So you you had an issue with the uh, nappy hair comment. What what, what 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 bothered you about that when she said what, that she didn't have a right to say nappy hair or? No, or what, I what think I think I think it was an I think it was an argument of acceptance. Well, the way I perceived it was like. I identify with being black because look at my hair or, you know, I think she said something to the sentiment of like, thank goodness for good hair products you know, now, but when I was younger, my hair was nappy and things like that. Like that's supposed to be an identifier for, for us, you know, um, African-Americans to be more acceptance because that's how she identifies with being black. So accept me because of my hair texture. That's what I perceive from the video. Okay, so, um, if she, so she would have said the same thing, but she was a dark skinned black woman. Would you have had an issue with it? No, because I don't think all African-Americans, I don't think that hair identifies you as being identifies your race. So, and I think that's a big disclaimer too. And I think that that's been stigmatized in the black community anyway. I don't think hair identifies or makes a person, I've seen all different types of hair types. So I don't think that that's, and should, should be an issue or a conversation to have because that's also causes the divide too, right? Like, you know, you're, you're pretty for being dark skin or you have long hair or dark skin people are supposed to have this or light skin people are supposed to have this. And then it causes that consistent divide that we just constantly indoctrinate and it starts from a young age or what's heard in the family or you know the people that surround you. So um, like he said, we shouldn't be having this conversation in this day and age because we're all going through it and we need to be more um, you know, united versus, versus divided. Well, and, 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 and okay, I hear you on that. Um, I'm just gonna say this and then what we're gonna do, we're gonna go to another video clip and we're gonna talk about privilege. And I, Excuse me, we're gonna talk about shrinking. I'm gonna to go to the tab of the bottom clip, clip, but I want to say this. So, in preparing for this, I admit I was coming in at a deficit. So I, I was really just a sponge, just taking information. So, like long extended conversations with uh, Lori Reed and some other other friends of mine who are uh, biracial but identify as black, and then some friends who are light skin, right? Matter of fact, I spoke to some of my friends who are light skin that I mean, they're light, they're not dark, but they're not like light skin, but they're lighter, but they're not dark skin, if that makes sense, right? And it was interesting. So one of the things I think in terms of whatever this dynamic is that goes on in our community, I think part of the issue might be, let's just, just for, I'm just kind of hearing what you guys are saying and what I've heard other people say, is that, um, that our pain as being darker skin is far more significant than their pain. And I would argue based on the feedback that I got from them and what their experiences are, that uh, that's probably where the impasse is. That although it's not the same pain, and one reason why that could be the case, I see your hand laying, but come to you next real quick, right? Is that I think there's, because they have a privilege, you know, Dr. Mars, she just talked about the halo effect and the beauty cue. And so there's these built-in systems. So our response is probably kind of like, well, damn. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, I mean, you know, like, you know, cry me a river. <laughs> it's like, right? So uh, Lynn Silverberg, you want to say something? 
that's what I thought I conveyed earlier. That's what <laughs> separates the pain is the privilege. She just broke it down and gave statistics and research. She cited research. But so does their I, pain mean that they, does that their privilege mean that they don't experience a deep seat, deep seated pain as well? But uh, no, I'm acknowledging, right, right. I'm acknowledging the pain. I know right. that they do. And I'm not saying that they don't, but to compare that to a darker skinned person to me is not the same. Ah, or, I mean, she just- And, and she same. also- she Every also situation is different. I don't know how you, can, how you can compare someone else. I mean, like I said, pain is pain. And for us to even be discussing this, I mean, it, to me is kind of, it's weird. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, pain is pain. And, uh, you know, I understand that, you know, darker skinned people have different sort of hurdles possibly, but they have hurdles too. I've seen it. So like, I mean, I don't think we can kind of like have a, a pissing contest of whose pain is more, whose pain is greater. Yeah. Lynn Beatty, you were saying, making a comment. Well, I was just going to say, she also differentiated between systemic privilege um, and halo effect, all that versus individual. So I don't think anyone's denying that there may be individual pain and there probably is, I mean, because I think we all have pain in our lives for different reasons, but um, as it relates to the color of the skin tone from light or to, to dark, that there's data that shows that there's some benefits to being lighter skinned in this culture, in this, in this society, in this country. Um, but that, so that can be a systemic impact that the dark, darker of the community are experiencing because of that. Um, whereas the lighter members of the community maybe don't have as much of that systemic impact, but they still have individual pain, which is very real. So I don't think they're, they're mutually exclusive by any means, um, but maybe just looking at kind of the, the cause of the pain, um, you know, so I, I was just trying to add that additional clarity, which she provided earlier around the research. Yeah. So, okay. And, and, I, and I want to kind of say this so, to, to make sure that we're all on the same lane, because I, I, I think it was kind of easy to kind of veer off a little bit, because we, we're, we're dealing with something that's very direct here. I mean, we talked about life skin. We promoted this stuff. So we're going to stay in this lane. We're talking. So I hear on a macro level, we're saying that we go through a dark skin Black people, we go through a lot, clearly. Research says that we're behind the eight ball. Everything suggests we're behind the eight ball. Our own experiences suggest we're on the eight ball. I mean, I can't put on a black suit going to a black tie event without being mistaken for being the help. I get it. Always this happened to me, right? So I get on, on steroids. What I'm saying to you from what I've been hearing, and the beauty is we're going to talk about this on the third podcast where you guys will come back and you're going to have an interaction with our lighter skin uh, brothers and sisters who are biracial. And so we're gonna talk about this, but I'm just telling you what I heard. I'm not, I don't have a dog in the fight. I'm just sort of reacting, right? Not taking a position. I am saying that I think that you are under, or excuse me, that they will say you're underestimating the depth of their pain in our community by us, particularly as pertains to your reaction to substantiated information that suggests that they have a privilege, which they will not disagree with. But they consider themselves Black and have a Black experience, but y'all don't show me the love. That's what I hear. Okay, go ahead, Erica. Okay, so what I would say to, to counterpart what you just said, and okay. I speak to the panel when I say this. Okay. So the doctor, the doctor came with data and facts. So when they come to us with data and facts, to counteract the evidence, right, and cite whatever they're saying, then I would probably have a different answer. So since they don't have a counterpart, when we go to the third, the third meeting, they'll have some data and some facts to, to counterpart. Because at the end of the day, I like we said, when we talk about institutionalized and like the machine, that's one thing, right? That's data and facts. We can't always, we can't always fight too much against data and facts unless there's a consensus. When we talk about personal, I can't fight against anybody's personal experience because that's their personal individual experience. I can't argue with somebody about their personal experience. But when it comes to data, she came to us with data, right? On this right. panel today, tonight, there was right. data presented. In the right. first show, there was no data. There was just personal experience, right? How they felt, their trauma or whatever. We respectively listened or whatever. So when they come to us with data, then we will 
have a conversation about that. But there needs to be data that says, I did not use my, my, my privilege, right? Did not affect this and I didn't get this and I didn't acquire this, or it did not in, a, affect or cause trauma. She said in the data that all these things affected marriage and affected this. And we don't know if this is fully true, but this is coming from someone that has done her homework, right? Right, the statistical data. Right. That's all I'm right. saying. Okay. So, and, no, okay. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. so, so, um, and there are some people who actually are here from the, uh, the previous, uh, podcast too. They're probably listening in and they probably have a thought. I see your hand, Cedric. We'll get you in a second. But, um, but so those are some things that we will look at because there probably is some research that would suggest not that one's greater than the other, but there is some pretty significant that I am suggesting that we might be over. And, and I'm only saying this too, because this is kind of what I went through. And this is why I thought this was so fascinating, that there is a level of pain that never gets addressed. You know why? Because kind of what we're saying right now, boo-hoo, boo-hoo. <laughs> it's like, okay. And I'm just saying, this is what I've heard from multiple people, even some people who are just a little bit fair. Oh, don't even talk about the hair. I'm just saying some very interesting dynamics to, to associate with that. Okay, uh, Sergio, you want to say something? Yeah, I'm just going to lighten it up a little bit. I know we're getting in the, in the deep, deep end, but I, I do, I am kind of curious. I do want to hear uh, from, from my fellow panelists what their dating experiences has been like or what marriage has been like for them in terms of like, are they married? Have you been proposed to? Da, 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 da. You know, what do you like? What you dislike? And I'll just say for me, it's just like, as long as you black, it was all good with me when I was single. And I would just say like, I use the TV show Different World. You know, I think we're all kind of like in the same age range or what have you. And it's like, most people just automatically assume that most people was checking for Whitley. Whereas myself, I was checking for Jaleesa, me personally. <laughs> right, so right. I was checking for, and again, not to say that Whitley wasn't cute and all that great stuff, but like I said, ah was checking for Jaleesa. So yeah, I just kind of always moved in that space when it came, you know, to women and stuff like that, as long as you was black. <laughs> that's all I cared about. You can be light bright, you can be as dark as night. As long as you look good to me and I was feeling your energy and your spirit, I didn't give a damn what your skin tone or what your hair looked like, so. Now, now I'm sure you made a lot of sisters feel good here on, on that because it's good to hear a brother say, you know, look, I love an authentic black woman, particularly dark skin, whatever the case is. But you know something? We're not going to pivot there just yet because we're going to go there. Remember, that's our our fifth uh, pillar we're going to get to. So we're going to get to that. But thank you for giving us a sneak peek <laughs> of what direction we're going to go with that. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to step away from this and go to another uh, video clip. And this is about... Uh, under the category of shrinking. And this is Tabitha Brown. And I thought it was very interesting what she said about shrinking. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to roll the video clip and talk about it on the other side. I don't want to see a black woman on TV with locks. And I believed her. And so then coming out here and having to lose weight, uh, straighten my hair, cover mm -hmm. my accent, I created this version of Tabitha mm -hmm. that I thought Hollywood wanted, that I thought would help me win, mm -hmm. you know, and I created her so deeply that even, you know, the majority of my friends that I made out here didn't know the true me. I was working at this job at my office and I had, you know, taken a break and uh, my girlfriend had called me. We were on the phone. Who's an amazing uh, Zaynab Johnson. She's a comedian and she's like one of my best friends and we're talking and my daddy called and I said, like, oh, hold on. Let me answer this phone call. Talk to my daddy on the other line for, you know, probably two minutes, click back over and she didn't recognize my boy. She was like, hello, because I was such in my freedom with my daddy that I forgot when I clicked back over. She was mm. like, I ain't never heard your voice be so country. And I was like, oh, not even my real friend knows my real voice. Wow. And that it did something to me in that moment. In the back of my head, I put it there, but it bothered me for years when you create this other person to try to win, mm -hmm. but it ain't you. It ain't freedom. Wow. Now that's, that's very interesting. Cause well, I'm going to talk to you guys about this. Now this was interesting. You mean 
she created an entirely different person <laughs> that she felt she needed to do to live and thrive for Hollywood. You know, she's about losing weight and everything else and so forth. So, and then she built these authentic friendships, kind of authentic, because when she got into her freedom of who she really was, she was sort of exposed, but it, she was personally enlightened. Uh, shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Jackie, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever found yourself shrinking or some sort of shrinking as being a dark-skinned Black woman in any situation? If so, please give us some insight. I believe so. Um... Going back to elementary, junior high and high school, I was one of few black people in my school. Um, I was in one, if not the only one in some of my AP classes or some of the courses I took. Uh, so I was, I started to resonate with the people who were in my classes, you know, and back in those days, you know, you went from, uh, you, had, you had some of the same people in multiple classes. So then I was becoming more engaged with more multicultural, mostly white, you know, non-black, because those were the people who I had the same interest with in the same classes. So I remember that my family, um, you know, we get together. I was, and then I lived in the Valley. So then I was the valley girl. Oh, she sounds like a white girl. And I remember saying, I told my mom, I said, why do they say I sound like a white girl? And I said, why can't I just sound like an articulated black woman, you know, a black girl? So I, I, mean, I, I do say that I think I've had this hat and I've worn it um, somewhat of a mask, but then I started, started, started to say that perhaps it's not necessary. I'm not being less black. I'm just this elevated black woman. I can speak well. I can, I can engage um, uh, multiculturally. Um, um, I dated in high school um, non-black because I wasn't asked out by the black folks. I wanted to go to the movies. I wanted to go skating. So I know I'll never forget the first time my mother asked. I said, Jackie, I'm going hold, out. Hold on, hold on for a second. Oh. I, I, I Am I make going sure. too much? No, 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 you're, you're fine uh, with an asterisk. I want to know what you, like for instance, if you grew up in the Valley, mm -hmm. just in terms of your environment, you may pick up a certain type of dialect and so forth. I, I get that, yeah. right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about as being a black woman, knowing you're a black woman but you're in whatever environment you may be in and you may feel and perceive that as being an authentic dark-skinned black woman that whatever that is you can't be who you really are similar to what tabitha brown did i'm asking you did you make a conscious decision to shrink or to be less than yourself as a result of being somewhere anywhere with anyone okay. that yeah. you felt so you couldn't be yourself because you're dark skinned. Right. Woman. No, I, I cannot I cannot say that as a dark skinned woman, um, I had to shrink. Um, because in the environment that I was with and the friendships I had, I was the only one. So I got to be, I got to define what black was. Okay. So I no, I, I cannot say that so I like step step down from there. Right. I didn't have to um in my opinion, I don't feel that I had to um, be less black or, or, or less, you know, less black as a dark woman because, like I said, I was the I was the black person, so okay. I got to. So whatever you what did was defined as black and so forth. Okay, got right. it, got it, got it, got it. So, Lynn Beatty, let me ask you something. So, do you think code switching is a form of uh, shrinking? Do we all um, know what code sw switching is? We all ever know what code switching? Is? Do we need to define it? Let's just define code switching for the sake yeah. of order. Oh, yeah. Go code ahead. switching is when, for instance, we may say, yo, what's up, homie? Oh, yeah, what's up? No, yeah, yeah, I know, right? That was tripped up. And then you call, so I don't know, job come home for me. Hello, this is Carrie Neal. How you doing, Bob? Yeah, I know, yeah. Let's meet you on hold on tomorrow morning. So, okay, all right. Click. That's code switching.
that you take on this sort of um, Eurocentric persona, so to speak, depending on your environment? So first of all, I don't think that code switching is a bad thing necessarily. Okay. I think that makes us very versatile. I think many of us can go into just about any sort of situation and thrive. Um, so I think there are some benefits to knowing how to do that. You know, um, I don't think, you know, it's just like growing up. You can't act the same way in church as you might out on the playground, right? You know, so there's 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 a need to be able to to kind of maneuver through the world. And I think Black people have had to learn how to do that effectively. So um, I think shrinking maybe is a, a, a next level where you feel like you've, you're almost losing who you are. Like if based on what Tabitha was saying, she had kind of internalized this uh, altered person. And so I think that's much more damaging. And so you don't think that doing talking that way, what we do, we're talking about, like saying that that's not a form of, of shrinking? I don't think so. I don't think, yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, you asked for my opinion, that's what I'm giving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that code switching is just, I, I don't think it's bad unless, you know, for some reason you're doing it because you feel that there's, there's you know, pressure, um, you know, like you're not being accepted. And so you just like totally, hit, okay, now like yesterday they didn't like it when I used this particular word. Tomorrow, let me use a different word or whatever. But if it's just being able to kind of maneuver through life in different circumstances and, and be able to thrive and be effective and to talk to multicultural people and, you know, I don't, I mean, kind of like Jackie was saying earlier, I mean, I don't, can't tell you how many times I've been, people thought that I was a white woman because of, you know, on my business call, it's like, hello, this is Lynn, you know, um, so, so I think we all do that. I, um, but uh, I think that shrinking, on the other hand, is much more damaging and much worse because you're you're kind of giving up who you really are more it sounded like she was doing it like around the clock i mean her best friend didn't even really know who she truly was yeah so you know i just kind of wonder because we talked this whole thing about being diverse you know everybody's talking about dei dei diversity inclusion uh, and equity and inclusion excuse me diversity equity inclusion right um, and I wonder if some people would probably see, and, and you're right, I think we all have to do it on some level one way or the other, but I, I wonder if that is, if you can't show up as your most authentic, sound like similar to crown that your hair grows out of your head a certain way. So you mean, unless I put my hair like a European hairstyle is, then it's not professional, whatever. Lynn Silverberg, what's your reaction to the, the the whole notion of code switching is that a is that a form in your viewpoint of shrinking? No, um, I do agree with Lynn. Uh, Lynn. Oh, we don't we don't we can't your volume just disappeared. I guess it's like a two way street. We she can't hear us, and we can't hear her. So, yeah, I think oh, she's okay. having Wi Fi issues. Yeah, she's having Wi Fi issues like that. That's uh, my authentic self. <laughs> So okay, so um, I'm gonna go to um, let's let's Eric. I want to ask you something really quick. Okay, so is straightening your hair, wearing a long hair wig, or a lace front, you know, is that a form of shrinking? I mean, because I'm thinking, because I, I I've heard women say, "Oh, this is just a protective style and that kind of thing." Let's say they may have cornrows and they put some kind of hair, but it's not uncommon. And you see it all over social media. The women they'll put these the hairs and cornrows, and then they put this <laughs> down to the butt hair, kind of long. I don't, I, why can't why 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 can't uh, why can't I? wear like a big fro kind of a thing as a protective hairstyle. You never see the the fro's as a protective hairstyle. You typically see I've seen them. I've seen them. I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm just I'm just asking the question. I'm just kept I'm just, I'm just mm -hmm. so I'm wondering are those things in your, your mind is that a form of shrinking? 
Um, I think to each his own. I like to be versatile. You might see my hair red one day. You might see it curly. You might see it blue. I mean, I think, and I've always been like that. I think it's an individual choice. I think people have their own reasons why they change their hairstyle. I mean, I had locks for eight years, if you see my picture. So I think it just depends on where you are in life or where you're trying to be or, you know, um, and some people wear it for different reasons, for religious reasons, for spiritual reasons. Um, and, H and women are so versatile in so many different ways in addition to men. So um, I think when it comes to like the workplace, I think people have been faced with certain things, um, being African-American, whether you're light skin, dark skin, just being African-American and, and being diverse, um, people are faced with those obstacles sometimes, feeling like they can't wear their hair a certain way or I've heard stories about even down to children, right? They can't wear locks or they feel they can't wear their hair in a natural quote unquote way. Um, so I think it just depends. Every individual situation so, so, is different. Okay, so you're, so you're telling me that um, wear your hair long as a wig, as a protective style is not, that's just a choice, right? Just a choice, right? Is that what I'm hearing you saying? That's just a choice. Because you I do. think it's a choice. It's it's a choice, but at the same time, I've seen people that are not black wear their hair down to their down to their ankles. I don't care about them. I'm talking about black yeah. people. I wonder what black people do in the black. This is only I'm because I'm talking so about the world. I can't answer for us. black people. I can answer for me. I can't I'm, ask, I'm for asking you, else. you, Erica. I want you. I want to know what you do. I don't want everybody else to do. I, what I you wear. Do. I wear my hair in individual styles, depending on how I feel. I'm versatile. Got it. That's that's my answer. Got it. So Lynn yeah. Silver, I don't come back. To, I won't come back to you. Okay, I'm sorry, Erica, you want to say something? I'm sorry, did you No, I was, back? but you asked me, is it a is it a form of shrinking? For me, it's not. It's, it's not, not a form it. of shrinking. Totally clear on that. Okay. Lynn Silver, I want to come to you. Uh I, I think you're having some technical trouble trouble, but that's okay. <laughs> We're gonna pivot to this question. Is wearing a wig that's long, like you got long, luscious hair, like Jennifer Aniston or somebody like that, right? Um <laughs> okay jennifer aniston but okay <laughs> okay and is watching friends a form of shrinking no i'm kidding no sir <laughs> so is wearing i'm this is serious you guys stop laughing stop it okay is wearing a wig just long as a protective hairstyle lace front the whole bit in your opinion is that a form of shrinking um no it's not okay no um i think people can get creative with hair i know i have for me personally i have abandoned that look for a more natural look so that's where i'm at in my life because i want to show up authentically in the world as myself um so no i don't think it's shrinking but it's just not a preferred look at the moment i may put on a wig if i want to but for at the moment i want to i just want to be natural I, I i'm just i'm just curious if um i'm just asking a question just asking a question i'm just a moderator okay. here okay don't attack me, you guys it's just i'm just throwing stuff out there right for us to talk about right so i'm just i'm just sort of wondering right so you guys just say, well, it's just a hairstyle, but it's a choice, personal choice. And I think it's interesting because uh, Dr. Chris Mars said early in the beginning, and this wasn't about hair, but it's about when her students said, I just like light-skinned women. I just do. And she said, no, you don't. So you've been conditioned to think that's what you like and that's what's preferred. And then we talk about the whole thing about the beauty cue and talk the thing about the halo effect, right? And we all agree this is stuff of this is a kind of a byproduct of white supremacy. But when we put on long, luscious hair and get our Jennifer Aniston on and things like that, that's sort of independent of all the other stuff that's going on. I mean, that's what you're saying, right? That is different. And I'm just trying to figure out what we're doing here. If you're asking me personally, I, that's why I have abandoned that look because I want to show up as my black authentic self with my natural hair. Absolutely. So for me personally. For so you personally, right? Why, yes. Right. Um, I wanted to abandon that look because I want to be accepted in the dating world, in the in the in corporate America as my in my authentic form. It, and that's what I want. So for me, I 
I said, well, hell, let me lock my hair, you know, because I want, I want to be extremely natural. So that's just for me personally. I can't speak for all black women, but I do, I have, I can't say that I haven't had a weave. Yes. I mean, I've only been on my lock journey for a little over a year and I have worn weaves um, for a long time. And it really, it was for a protective. I mean, there's something me and my um, my um, stylist would say, like a weave is not for, you know, like for vanity, but for the busy. <laughs> like I was too busy. I was working. I was in school. I didn't have time to do my hair. So I did see it as a protective style. And so you, it's all, I think we're going to conclude, but I want to like make sure we're kind of staying on track here. But so I'm, I'm hearing that those type of hairstyle, despite the fact how Eurocentric they may be, is just a choice and it's independent of, the impact and the imprint of white supremacy. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, so we're gonna move on and we're gonna go <laughs> to our next subject, uh, next pillar within um, our uh, podcast and we're gonna talk about uh, privilege and privilege is described as an advantage. Okay, so we have another, uh, now uh, it's about to get kind of, intense in here okay just kind of go with it but we're just kind of making a point okay so this is a video clip from the real housewives of <laughs> wherever that town called p uh i guess it's in maryland somewhere potomac potomac that's it yeah yeah and so, so let's roll the video clip and we'll talk about it on the other side garbage individual you have no soul thanks Ken. the fact that you will sit up here and act as if you are the victim you are the reason that women cannot come forward with sexual assault and sexual misconduct allegations because you sit up here with your privileged white looking ass and you think you can say whatever the f you want to say and no one is going okay, to bat an eyelash wait wait wait, wait. Okay, right. Yeah. That that's a little far. No, it's that's, not. No, that's no, no it isn't. Far. It is. No, it too isn't. Far. You're way too far. No, it isn't. Your so, proximity to whiteness helps you what? to be able to sit up here and tell these lies. You cannot sit here and call her white privilege when she's a black female. What is wrong with y'all? It's the colorism issue that we just talked about, and you're still reintroducing into this group. Let's let's call uh, Wikipedia. You know, y'all got to keep me for a second. I need to turn the AC on because it's getting hot in here. <laughs> anyway, so that was a lot to unpack there, right? Um, um, I'm going to thank my dear friend, Lori Reed, for sending me that video clip. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to absolve myself from association with it. Anyway, so um, that was interesting because obviously, you know, there's a situation going on, whatever kind of messy muscling thing that typically goes on in these type of uh, Real Housewives shows. But then she talked about that one reason why she was doing it had a lot to do with the fact because she was privileged and she kind of doubled and tripled down on that. But what I also thought was interesting that there are other women who were Black who made it very clear, that's not fair, why you go in there and things like that. But one was sold out Oh my God, this is why this is happening. Okay, so Jackie, so I want to ask you, and I'm, you know, you kind of talk about your background a little bit, so this is probably not <laughs> as applicable to you, but we're going to ask you anyway. But the question says, have you ever found yourself getting upset, mad, snippy, or rude at a light skin or biracial person just because of the color of their skin? For any reason? No, no, I, I, I. So, so, so hold, hold on, let me, let me okay. rephrase that. So. <laughs> Let's no, say, I've answered. <laughs> let's let's say that a black person who's darker skin did whatever this thing was, and you may be kind of eh, whatever else, but let the light skin biracial person do the same thing, you lose your freaking mind. Is that have, have you ever done anything like that? I'm going to tell you honestly, I I don't um, I don't buy into uh, our separation. I mean, I I, I recognize that. There is privilege associated with the uh, lighter skin folks. And I, I, again, I, I'm acknowledging that there, there's their pain and whatnot, but I am not going to look at um, like that, that nonsense. First of all, I don't know that that woman or that was just she was just grossly uh, uh, unattractive. But that's another whole conversation. But I would not look at that. Um, I Dang, you've been off on her, man. Well, what's up with that? I, I just I, I'm like, do you know her personally? No, I, but I was, I don't want to know her. Woo. Okay, okay. I'm just Anyways, curious. Yeah. All I'm saying is that that's- Small world, but you know. I, I, 
I could not react like that if it was a, I my, my reaction would be the same if it was a dark skinned person, if there, whatever led up to that, um, talking about the sexual assault or something or another, I, I, I just see that as, as an awful human being. I'm not gonna feel any, uh, any less um, or any more outrage because she's, she's fair skinned. You were just an awful person. I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I don't value you. I don't want to know you. I don't, um, and I'm, I'm not going to discount you or discard you. And say you're, you're no longer, you're not a black person. You're just an awful black woman. Yeah. As yeah. simple as that. It, it's, it's also fair to say that there's a, there's another clip that exists. We just don't have it on here. We just, for the sake of time, um, that shows that there was a lack of sensitivity uh, by Candace. You guys familiar with the show, you know who Candace is, uh, to Giselle. So that's something we also want to throw out there as a disclaimer. Um, but but again, so I'm going to sort of reload this same question. I'm going to go to you, Erica. And again, I'm going to encourage you to be as authentic as possible. You know, whatever the case is, you're in a safe space. This is a safe space. Urban Birds and Bees provides an emotionally safe space for you to be <laughs> honest and keep a stack. Erica, have you ever been snippy, nasty, had an attitude and everything else with someone who is light skin or biracial just because that's what they are, where we're and whatever the situation would be. Meaning that if someone was dark skin and they did the same thing, that the reaction would have been different. No, I haven't had any experiences with that. Okay. At all. Gotcha. No. Okay. Lynn, BD? Uh, I would have to agree with everyone else. I, I mean, if someone's doing something that's annoying, their skin tone doesn't affect me. I mean, if they're a black, a black person and light skinned or dark skinned, I consider everyone, you know, to be black and I wouldn't be any more offended if they were light skinned. Um, so no. Okay. Okay. And, and, but like I said the other day, um, you know, I've got like many of us, you know, when she all, says the other day didn't mean I kind of talked to everybody when we talked. And so they're making reference to being prepared for this stuff. So I just want to make sure you guys didn't miss anything. This is preparation, which she's making reference to. Go ahead, Lynn. Yeah. I was just saying like so many other people on the panel have said, you know, when you look at my family, it's a whole rainbow of brownness and blackness, right. You know, my sister, who's just two years older than me, could pass as a Hispanic woman. You know, uh, my father was darker than me. I mean, so it's just a wide variety. And so I, I don't really um, focus on skin tone that much in my interactions with people and, you know, reaction to people. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. I, I got a slight uh, correction I want to make. So, um, there was a lack of sensitivity um, um, towards Giselle, towards, excuse me, by Giselle, by Giselle uh, towards uh, Candace. And that was just a clip we just weren't able to get. So I just wanted to just clear that up because those of you who have familiar with this season, you probably could like say, oh yeah, well, this is what actually happened. So so let you know that we're well aware of that. So, um, um, so I'm, I'm going to assume this is, doesn't apply to you, but I'm going to ask you the question anyway. So do you feel... That the and, per, and particularly from our previous uh, podcast, I mean, there were light skin and biracial people who understood that they were aware that there was a privilege that they had because they were light skin um, or biracial. Um, but do you feel that uh, that the, this privilege that's been confessed to by uh, light skin and biracial people in the black community is oftentimes flexed? that they know it exists and they use it to their advantage, even if it pisses you off. Have you ever experienced anything like that? I would say yes and no, okay. uh, for sure. Well, tell us about the yes, I'm not care about the no. Tell me about the yes. <laughs> um, I would say it's like with, you know, with friends back home, just being from the South. Yeah, you know, light-skinned guys, light-skinned girls were more favored than, you know, us on the dark end, you know, of the spectrum and stuff like that, whether it was in school or, you know, social settings, you know, going to the skating rink, 
and you know his last call for a dance yeah more times than not especially in the 80s yeah it's like all the light-skinned people you know got picked first or what have you more times than not so it would really wasn't until thank god for new jack city you know with wesley snipes and you know and michael jordan coming out to the scene that you know those things started to change but i just think you know to the question that you posed to the uh ladies earlier yeah i was very much like that in terms of like a light skin dude I, I would automatically think like dude you're soft just off top don't know anything about you just based off appearances you're soft and you're not about that mm -hmm. and again you know just now just as a grown man like dude like that's crazy that's sick but that's just how twisted my head was in terms of the imaging and just the experiences that I you know that I went through you know just as a kid and as an adolescent and stuff so yeah yeah, um, yeah, and that's really quick. Where, where, where you think that comes from? That if a guy is light skinned or biracial, he's not as masculine or tough, um, or even black. Um, I would say that house Negro feel Negro type of mentality. To be honest with you, is like yeah, oh, explain because, explain that explain that for those who may not be familiar I with mean, the house Negro. The house Negro, yeah, you did stuff in the house, you know, whether it was cooking, cleaning, butler made, so on and so forth. Whereas you know, field Negro, yeah, you out there in the field getting it, you know, hard skilled labor, what have you. So yeah, you know, that was somewhat you know of a divide. You know, yeah, you was in the AC or where it was cool. Whereas others, you know, were outside. You had you know, the house Negro had the better share of the food, so on and so forth. And again, I'm just generalizing just for the sake of conversation. But, you know, but yeah, but those are the things that's just been perpetrated, you know, just throughout, you know, and I would just say, especially more so in the South. Yeah, I hear that a lot. Oh, man, you ain't nothing but a house Negro or you, you know, or you just an end. So. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, that's, um, that's interesting. Um. Lynn Silverberg, I want to come to you, right? Um, so I want to talk about this whole thing about the flexing too, but, you know, in preparation for all this, you know, we also had some pretty vigorous discussions as well. Um, and you made the, um, uh, we don't have the image, but you, I mean, you sent me this, this, it was a picture. And let me get, let me see if I can remember. It was uh, Swiss Beats was on there. It was Jay-Z, uh, was Diddy. It was Kanye and was one other person. Who's the other person that was in that group? Was it was it was it Nas? No, it wasn't Nas. It wasn't that wasn't Nas. Yeah. But, anyway, it, but at least but those at least we had those. I remember those four, right? Right, right. So and behind them um was obviously behind Switch Beats was Alicia Keys. Uh obviously behind Beyonce behind Jay-Z. Uh who was behind uh Diddy? Cassie. Cassie, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then it was uh Kanye, you know, obviously it was Kim Kardashian behind uh Kanye West, right? Right. So um, and you had a certain reaction to that. If you don't mind, could you kind of share your thoughts regarding that picture and what it meant? And particularly uh, because there seems to be this thing that, oh, this thing was back in the 80s and 90s, this whole colorism, jig wannabes and jigaboos. And you said, um, that you beg to differ, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. Please kind of share what your perspective was on that. And I thought it was very interesting. And then you you threw it in throwing Chris Brown because you talked about that as well. Right. Um, I think someone on your previous panel had mentioned something like that being an old to the 90s. And I just totally disagree with that. Um, as a chocolate woman, I I mean, these images are the this conversation about um light skin being preferred is very relevant in, in our community right now. I mean, we have Chris Brown on social media and he's referring to dark skinned women as the uglies. Every opportunity that he gets and he is notoriously known for discriminating against darker skinned women and VIPs when he's at the club. Um, and to say that it's not, it doesn't exist or to me, it's almost like gaslighting me as a dark skinned woman. Like, no, this is my experience. This is true. When you have casting calls from straight out of Compton saying explicitly no dark skinned girls, like these things are real to me. And, you know, people are saying that, oh, no, that's not true. Or that's in the 90s. That picture that I sent you was 2016. That's not even 10 years old. 
So to say that that's not, you know, that it doesn't exist for me personally is offensive. Mm. What what and so what and so what did that picture of all of those um multimillionaires, I think Jay-Z is a billionaire status now. What did that represent to you? Because you made another distinction about the, what I thought was interesting as well. It's more than hip hop. These are these men in this particular picture are some of the wealthiest men. They're some of the wealthiest men in our in our community. And I'm thinking as myself as a woman, as a Christian woman, I'm like, oh, can we make uh, billionaires? You know, when we have this image. You know, do we have access to that kind of wealth or do or do they do those type of men find us attractive? Those are the questions that I asked when I saw that picture. Mm. And so with, with that said, we're going to pivot to our last category, uh, which I think this is, is right on. Um, you know what, before we do, I want to read some of these comments that are coming in, which is kind of interesting. So uh, uh, one says it's almost as if they make it. They have to go light, bright, darn near white, or they get a white woman. I mean, how many times have I heard that, right? So that's uh, that's interesting. Okay, so we're going to go to the category of um, beauty, dating, and love. Okay, so Lynn, BD, let me go, I'm going to go to you, right? So do you feel like that there is a disadvantage in the, we heard the statistics, but I want to know what your experiences are, right? Do you feel that you are at a disadvantage because you are single? You may be booed up now, but you're you're single right now. I'm, I'm putting your business out there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just single. What's... You're just single. Okay. Like, yeah. That means she's not exploring, you guys. That means that <laughs> she, she, she's just, she's unmarried. You're unmarried. That's what you are. There you go. Yeah. You're unmarried. Okay. Uh, do you feel like you're at a disadvantage being a dark-skinned Black woman when you're dating, particularly as it pertains to um, light-skinned um, your life game, uh, women counterparts? I, I do. I, I don't know if I can quantify that. Um, but I, I just, just like try to explain it. Just what, you know, what your thoughts are on that. It doesn't have to be perfect. I think just, you know, kind of what Lynn Silverberg was saying, using as an example in, in, you know, the hip hop, but just kind of, I, I think that, um, and I could be way off, but my my sense, like from being on dating apps and things like that, is that um, a number of black men are looking for lighter toned women. Um, it's crazy because on those apps, I get approached by a lot of white <clears throat> men. Um, so it's not like I haven't given it some thought, but I just love black men so much. It's just I love them to death. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but. <laughs> But, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I feel like I can't really like put the, it's kind of a, a sense, I guess, just from kind of being in the dating world and kind of looking around and seeing like at events and parties, the ones that get asked to dance more, the ones that have, you know, partners already it seems like it's disproportionately, you know, the lighter women. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it's just my perception. If I'm wrong, then pardon me for anyone who's offended. But, but, um, but I think, you know, as we've talked about, the statistics actually, actually support that in terms of the women that end up having partners and ultimately getting married. Um, when I think about my... Um, my girlfriends, the ones that are single, uh, more of them are dark skin than the ones that are light. Mm. So, so, so yeah, um, that's, that's my sense, but I, I don't have the data to support that, but that's <laughs> my experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. We don't expect to be a social scientist or anything like that, but you know, just your experiment that, that that's great. But uh, Eric, I want to go to you because we had a conversation as well. You talked about how a lot of times you may, be walking down the street there in the, in the streets of Arizona, the hardcore streets of Arizona, right? And you may occasionally run into brothers who may be with someone of another race. And you said that they have a certain response uh, when you, some, uh, not, I don't know, I've characterized it being common, but maybe you've experienced before. Can you kind of talk about that for a second? Kind of like a nonverbal, it's like a look that they give me or they put their head down or it could be in a store, it could be in a Target. 
and they're kind of look over there's they either stare or look and I'm not even really paying them any mind I could be like in the shopping aisle or in checkout and I notice they might be I say other quote unquote um, fair skinned women or another race um, and they kind of just look I don't know if it's a look of shame or some sort of uh, validation or I don't know I can't really call it I can't tell what they're thinking but it's just always this look of like I don't I I I can't really put it into words but it's very odd to me um and I've been here for a while now and I see a lot of that I don't see a lot of I don't see a lot of African-American relationships here in Arizona at all it's predominantly other um, so that's, that's, and I, and, and a lot of people are migrating more here, but you don't see a lot of it here. So it's very hard for me. I'm single. It's very hard for me to date. So I kind of push that arena aside and focus on other things, but it has been somewhat of a challenge from my hmm. experience. Okay. So, and, and I want to stay with you for just for a, another question too. Uh, one person just commented and said, it seems like in Southern California, um, and my cousin Buki, she just said, "Okay, her name is Saria, but family name is Buki." <laughs> Says, "I mean, put your own bias, Buki." Uh, she said uh, that she agrees with you that even what's up with you? What's up? Um, uh, uh, that she agrees with what you just said. Um, that it seems like uh, black men in Southern California don't seem to want to get down with with the chocolate sisters, right? So. Um, you are in Arizona. I was talking to someone recently, and I think that uh, she wanted to date black men. And but she's in the throes of Orange County. <laughs> and I said, I'm not sure when many of us exist down there. <laughs> but anyway. I mean, I've had those I've had those conversations because I have you know people that I know you know African American, and I've had I'm very very blunt. And I'm like what's going on? You know, we have these conversations, I've, you know, and the resp some responses are, I like, don't get me wrong, I like Black women, but they're hard to find. And I'm like, and I'm looking around, you know, and I'm like, what do you mean they're hard to find? And he's like, well, my, my, my wife is Mexican, or my wife is, or my girlfriend's this, you know? And sometimes, like I said, sometimes it's in shame. And it's like, if that's who you like, and that's who you love, you know, that's cool. But I think when it becomes colorism, when you're against, you know, but if that's what you like, I respect what you like. I'm never um against what people like I think but what I've seen here is a lot of colorism um and I don't know and this sounds stereotypical and if anybody's offended by this statement that I'm about to say um because I have I have an African-American son he's 23 and I even asked him questions from his perspective um and some, sometimes the response is that it's just easier because mm. we're pegged as we're pegged as difficult or angry or whatever that may whatever that assumption quote unquote may be and it's easier and they maybe some african-american men feel that they're better received or tolerated i don't know but these are the conversations that i have and i digress but this is what my conversations have been from black men not all um and but then when they do see black women um it's very it's kind of like apologizing or looking like they're apologizing for something. It's like, don't apologize for that. That's what you like. That's what you like, but stand firm in whatever that is, you know, but I feel like they're more well received here. Um, and so that's been my experience. And like I said, I have an older son and the, most of the, most of the girls that he dates and I have this conversation with all the time. Let me, let me just say this. It's not, it's not black. Mm -hmm. It's not black. It's not black. Okay, uh, Sid, I'm going to go to you and then we'll get ready to wrap up because, uh, man, this two hours has flown by. Man, you guys are, you guys brought it. Oh, my God. But Sid, you, okay, so we're very clear that you are all about the sisters, right? And you, oh, yeah. you have a beautiful black queen uh, in Kim, for sure. Um, and so we're as short of our other two um, male guests. And one of the questions I was going to ask is, do you just think light-skinned women are more attractive than dark-skinned women? And clearly that's not where you stand, right? No. But, 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 but I want you to speak to some of the other bros that we just kind of know, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, is it your perception that a lot of the black, dark-skinned men that you know do find light-skinned, biracial women more attractive than dark-skinned 
What is your experience in your circles? What would you say? Again, this is not scientific. It is completely anecdotal. What what is it that you have experienced from um, you know your black male counterparts? I would say like keeping it totally one hundred. We keep it totally stacked. Keep it buck. I would say a majority of them are a little partial when it comes to that, uh, which. To this day, I still really don't understand, to be honest with you. But, you know, like I said, that's just me. And, you know, before I go any further, I just wanted to say, I put it in the chat. Like I said, I think all the women on the panel, like, just gorgeous to me. I know, right? Shit. Yeah, like, for real. So I just think, you know, it just, like I said, it just depends. And I just think, for me, I just had the unique experience because my paternal grandmother, dark skin, my maternal grandmother, super light skin. So I saw both. So that's why I have an affinity for both. So that's why it was never really a thing for me one way or the other when it comes to that. But I just think more importantly, yeah, and I think what Dr. Marsh had spoke to earlier, yeah, we've been conditioned to think that way. It's like, oh, you haven't arrived until you have this. It's almost like it's almost like that forbidden fruit type of thing, to be honest with you. It's like, yeah, you can't get her because she's here, you know, somewhat, somewhat like a hierarchy to be honest with you. And again, you know, as I stated earlier, it's like, hell, we're all catching it, you know, in some shape, form or fashion. But yeah, but to answer your question, yeah, uh, to be honest, yeah, some of the dudes I know, they are a little bit more partial. Not to say they won't talk or get with the sister, you know, who's on the dark end of the spectrum. But if it was just, just based off first appearances, we're not talking about personality, energy, spirit, none of that. Yeah, they were probably more lean towards the, towards the lighter skin. So, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Oh, Lynn Silverberg, you had a, a comment you want to make. I think also what's interesting about that is they may have that conversation among you all, but then they be in our DMs. <laughs> so <laughs> secretly. So I'm gonna put it out there. Um, so they do. So they'll say and that's that. where that's where that, no, that's where that look comes from. Private. No, you tell them the truth for real. You are exactly. and that's and, the truth. So, no, but and that's what I mean. And I call that it look. out because it happens to me yeah. a lot. Yeah, yeah that real. look, that yeah. look of shame yeah. that I get, the look of shame that I get, and that look, that's the look that yes. I get. That's the look that that's I get. That's the look. I, I completely understand and know what you're talking about. You're absolutely right. I get them in my DMs and I blast them every time. Don't do yeah, that. If you sure. cannot, if you can't recognize me or you can't celebrate me in public, then don't hit exactly. me in my DMs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like in the, the day lights. time you out, you know, trying to, right. you know, trying to get with the light skin, honey, whatever. But right. like I said, at night, when the lights go off, you trying to holler at the dark skin sister. And one right. that you, you trying to holler at me? But because, right. but That's because right. of that it's pressure, it's like people just <laughs> automatically assume you're supposed to, or just because you're a light skinned guy, you're supposed to be able to be with the light skinned woman and vice versa. When actually, well, that might not even be their flavor. But because right. of that pressure, whether it be family, friends, or what have you, we just go off into that space. And again, we just suffer from a sickness just, just on something completely, totally different. And I just wish that we can get to a space to where we can have real open dialogue conversations and just get rid of the confusion that's going on. Because again, like I said, we all catching hell. We all catching it in some yeah. shape. And you know, I want to <laughs> make another interesting point when I talk about my son, because I have this conversation with him and I say, okay. You know, he dates, you know, he dates around and I say, hey, what, you know, why I, I don't see you date? He's date, dated black African-American women. I said, why? And this is the first thing he said to me. He said, because I just can't. I, black women are not attracted to me. So he has his own at 23. He has his own experiences. Right. And so we got to dig deeper into that at some at a later time. But I had to talk to him further, you know, and he 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 still dates around. But. It's just interesting how he's perceived or received, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how, how Black women perceive him. And so he's just like, well, if I'm not being received by a Black woman, right, then I'm going to go this way because it's easier for me. I'm more received on the other side. So, so I'm, I'm going to ask this really quick and then we're going to get ready to wrap up. But I mean, we're talking about something pretty deep. I mean, we've got statistical information that suggests that um, white excuse me, well, light skin and a biracial men and women, but let's, we're talking about women right now in terms of talking about this whole appeal. I mean, we're talking about men and women, but let's just talk about women right now um, um, are more preferred 
uh, statistically speaking, uh, um, you know, said just talked about, you know, look, just we'll keep it stacked. Yeah, it seemed like a lot of the bros probably would prefer uh, the white skinned women. So I'm just wondering, and this is just to the panel, it sounds like just from some of the conversations I've had is that um, a lot of the light skinned biracial black women feel as though they catch hell from you guys because of this structural privilege that they've been given and you guys don't let up let up even to the degree if they step in the room that you're looking at them sideways this is what i've heard react to that please anyone I, I don't uh, I don't know who does that. I mean, I, I'm not saying again, no. I think it comes down to personal experiences. Mm -hmm. There might be a situation where a dark skinned person has that reaction to a light skinned person. But, you know, may, that might be personal beef between the two of them. Mm -hmm. It might be that person's background that there is some trauma that they're now taking out on everybody who looks like somebody else. But I think, you know, kind of you know, like Cedric has said, I mean, we all are carrying a lot of heavy weight, you know, light skin, dark skin or whatever. I, I don't, I don't have the bandwidth to be worried about some light skin person that walks in the room. I'm assuming and until they- So, 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 okay. so Julian, that, that's not you. So none of you guys do that. None of you guys do that. That, that never happens. No. I think no. you see more from men care, to be honest with you. Just, okay. I mean, I think I see that, that type of energy from men when it comes to that. And what we mean by men, in what, in what sense? It's like in a setting, whether it's at a conference or a club or a church or whatever. Okay. Uh, I think you see men, they like gawk at light-skinned women and they're like very apprehensive in terms of approaching them. Whereas they see, you know, a dark-skinned sister, whatever, they may be more uh, they more likely to approach that sister than I would say a light skin sister. And again, that's just what I've seen. I've seen that here in LA. Yeah, I've basically seen that everywhere I lived, except for Alaska. So, hold on. so you're saying that the dark skinned black male is more likely to approach a dark skinned black woman than the light skinned uh, black woman? Is that what I'm hearing? So, and I think it's more so fear based, just based off rejection or making the assumption that she already has somebody. Or there's other guys that's trying oh. to get her attention of what have you, don't really want to, or not as confident in themselves to like throw their hat in the ring, I guess, so to speak. And I want to put words in your mouth, but sounds like you're sort of inferring that a brother is a dark skinned brother, is likely to take the path of least resistance, or there's a higher likelihood that he will get a, a response and is not concerned about this. She may be with someone, though he may applied the halo effect that Dr. Marsh talked about with light-skinned women that, okay, yeah, she probably was a mind whatever else think that would preclude his successful engagement of her. That's why I'm hearing what you're saying. Yeah, for the most part, yeah, I would say so. Wow. Jackie, what do you think about that? You're on mute, you're on mute. I think that's, I think that's interesting. Um, I, hearing that this perspective for a black man like, like you're stacking and this is coming up. from a guy this guy right this right right i think that's yeah, very yeah. very interesting um <clears throat> but again but going back to the earlier question you were asking about black women i i for or seeing or approaching you know light-skinned people i don't i agree with lynn i don't have the bandwidth to um sit here and think oh okay light-skinned person let me okay let's let's you know let's let's get aggro let's get angry I, I I don't have that. I don't, I don't, um, that's just not my spirit. As a matter of fact, I mean, I'm with all black people, there's still the the nod, there's still the acceptance, there's still the how you doing? I see you. Um, and if it's not, if it if it isn't reciprocated, I don't sit there and think, oh, I I'm I, I feel an injustice because I'm dark skinned. You might just be an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know, and that's what the some of the other some of the other panels was, and I don't think they actually said on the actual uh, podcast, but in, in preparing for the podcast, there was so you know how like you like those say if I didn't see why should we get the so the head not like you know it, it's not saying hello how you doing today that's it's like I see you bro you know stay strong in the struggle and there's those on the um, 
who have said in some of the, the preparation for the podcast that they've never had that experience because they don't appear to be a part of our community or you're unsure. So <laughs> you're probably not going to do that to someone that you and are think, um, not sure about. Okay, go ahead, Jackie. I, I think perhaps that's that's their own insecurity because, you know, you get through, you receive the energy you give. So if you are feeling apprehensive about yourself or whatever elements are going on with you and you, and you, and you belittle your life struggle to just color, but I'm, I'm sad, I'm saddened for you. Well, okay, so let's let's go with that for a second. I'm gonna come to you real quick, uh, uh, Lynn, then we're gonna wrap it up as we go on over again, because y'all like wanna talk. I wanna keep talking. So let's talk about what a trigger is, okay? A trigger is the recreation of a situation that was actually experienced. So the trigger is something about the environment that is consistent with what actually happened has occurred again. So the body responds to that stimuli as if it's actually happening. So you're right, it is kind of sad. He is projecting and anyone may project, but that's the nature of a trigger. And sometimes it takes people to go to uh, therapy and things like that. What I'm suggesting to you, what I've heard, and we're going to talk more about this in a couple of weeks, is that it happens so often. Remember the, the Fox Soul video with the one lady, Mona Lisa Johnson? She said, I, I'm getting nervous and anxiety just talking about this. And you know what? It's, it it's appears that it's some sort of suppression that's going on. Because again, y'all not trying to hear it because they're privileged. Because they get benefits that you guys don't get. That's what they said. Lynn yeah. Silverberg. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I, I'm just gonna say this. <laughs> I think we I think it's important. <laughs> I think it's important in the black community that we we do have to validate each other's experiences. Right. I mean, because if we don't, then we begin to pathologize, which we, you know, which was what we just did, you know, like, is it an insecurity or is that a real issue? Like, or is that a real struggle or is that a real feeling? You know? So I do think that we need to do that. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, boy. <laughs> tell me, I'm going to need some security. <laughs> Lord Jesus. Oh. Oh, boy. Well, yeah, we're going to need some security for when, uh, in a couple of weeks. Okay, so we're going to get ready to wrap up here. I want to thank everyone uh, on Facebook Live and here at Zoom. And I'm going to go around to all the panelists. I'm asked to give uh, give us some parting words. Uh, so I'm going to start with Lynn Beatty. Talk to us. Um, can't we just all get along? <laughs> <laughs> Special guest next week, Rodney King. <laughs> <laughs> He's not around. He's, yeah, he's no, I past, mean, right? I, 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 I know that colorism is real and it exists in the black community. It actually exists in other cultures as well. I know. Listen, to some of you guys, y'all like saying y'all know what y'all look like, like. No, no, I don't think anyone's denying that it's there. I just don't think that it. It just don't exist with you guys. It's, it's, well, it's like everybody else. It's just not y'all. So I mean, I think maybe it's maybe other parts of the country. I don't, I don't know, it, but it truly, actually, colorism exists in other cultures as well, right? Yeah, just not on this panel. Got it. Yeah, and so, um, but but I, I I don't think it should dictate how we interact with other Black people because, you know, when it comes to the this country right now, there's enough negative energy against people of color that those of us light, dark, and everything in between really need to try our very best to support one another and stick together. So that's my closing words. Gotcha. Okay, Erica. All the way from Arizona, give some parting words. I agree with everything that Lynn said. <laughs> okay, give <it> short, sweet. <laughs> okay, cool, cool deal. <laughs> Lynn Silverberg, parting words. I agree with everything Lynn B said. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie, oh, you too. You like you did away now. I agree with everything Lynn B said. 
<laughs> Dang. Yo, said, bro, you really come up, bro. You're going to have to protect me. You know, they ain't got short on now. And they're like, they ain't really got much to say. Bro, I'm about to get cut. <laughs> no, I just, I think this was a very, uh, I think this was a great conversation, spirited conversation. Yeah. Uh, I, I love hearing about people's stories, their experiences. I just love people in general, especially my people, Black people. Right. So I would just say I'm really looking forward uh, to our next conversation, you know, the next couple of weeks, you know, with our counterparts, whatever. No, they're not counterparts. Yeah, our other brothers and sisters. sisters yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah, that's it right there. So, you know, to that end, I just really just want us to do better and be better because this is a sickness that has just been in, we just been infected with for so long. And it's like, we need to find the antidote. We actually have the antidote. We just got to be willing to take it and humble ourselves and just get off this bullshit that we're on. Because again, we all catching hell and we're dead last, regardless of skin tone. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's good. Um, uh, first, I want to give a shout out to uh, MJ of uh, LP or Let's Play Productions for uh, uh, handling all of the uh, Zoom operations. Uh, and she thought she was going to be quiet and just handle the business. But as you can see, she was the that that chat was on fire. <laughs> so 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 we thank you, Lynn. For, I mean, um, MJ, for your for your your stuff. And then also to Raymond Gibbs, who actually does a lot of the post work on the production to when we put the uh, podcast um on the all the pot, pot, podcast uh platforms one thing i want to say is um if you never saw that movie uh with uh, what's the guy's name uh but the movie name of the movie is a uh, rwanda hotel hotel rwanda excuse me you should watch it what's the guy's name that that was the the hotel manager, Don Cheadle, Don Cheadle. And um, you should watch that. Not about the story of the hotel, because it's kind of sort of story about the hotel, but it has nothing to do with the story of the hotel. It's got to be in one some stream. It's got to be YouTube, something like that. Watch it. Because it talks about people who look exactly alike that killed each other or oh, some bull. They took each other out. So much so, and don't look exactly alike and took each other out. You know, it's interesting having this conversation with you guys and then the previous uh, podcast. Um, very respectful and things of that nature. There's definitely some pain going on. There's definitely some trauma going on. Um, and I think there are some things that uh, probably might be better articulated by them and just sort of going off some of the things that I've kind of gone through with you, you know, I've heard from them and talking with you guys. Um, I, I look forward to our next podcast, uh, which is the third part in this series of Black, Biracial, and Light Skin in the Black Community. The Tootsies and the Hutu, that's a yeah, tribe, exactly. Thank you, Kimberly D, exactly. I'm always tongue tied trying to remember the, the, the two tribes. Um, you can even Google some of that stuff, it's very interesting. But anyway, but that's going to be on Wednesday, the uh, 29th of, of, of March. Um, uh, same link, same Facebook Live. Uh, we hope that you all will be available to come back to have that uh, very interesting exchange with our brothers and sisters who just happen to be of a lot of hue and maybe biracial but they're very much part of the Black community and what that will look like, right? So um, we got a long way to go. I mean, I know that's not true. We, I think we're making some great inroads and some great strides, but there's still some things that we need to sort out because uh, we're all in this community together. So again, I want to thank everyone for joining us today on Urban Birds and Bees. Um, Again, I am Kerry. I'm your host and moderator for Urban Birds and Bees. And again, we'll be back on in two weeks on the 29th of March. We're going to wrap up this three-part series on being Black, biracial, and light-skinned in the Black community. Well, thank all, let's, let's give our, all our panelists a big round of applause. Thank you guys for bringing it and being honest and keeping it stacked. Um, we will continue with this conversation. But until then, next time, 
Everyone have a great evening. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye.